Hello and uh, welcome to our webinar on climate justice. Um, I'm sitting here in the middle of uh, a wood in Oxfordshire. It's a lovely spring afternoon here and I'm with Christoph Schwartz who's from the Foundation for International Environmental Law and Development and Professor Miles Allen from Oxford University. My name is Peter Roderick and I'm going to be presenting the webinar over the next hour. Um, I first ask Christoph if you'd like to say a few words, Christoph, to introduce yourself and tell us about, about the webinar. Thank you, Peter. On behalf of Field, I just briefly wanted to say thank you to our funders, the artist Project Earth, APE, and of course everyone here in the One World Studio. Um, if you have any questions or comments during this webinar, please send them to field at field.org.uk. And what I maybe shouldn't say is that if you have an urgent appointment or you need to pick up the kids from school or you're working to close deadlines, then um, you can catch up with us in this webinar on YouTube later on. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And Miles, if you'd like to say a few words, introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to join you here, and I'll be uh, presenting some of the work we've been doing in the University of Oxford, uh, looking at the causes of climate change which uh, fit in with uh, these issues of climate justice. Okay, thanks very much, Miles. Um, we're going to start off, I'm going to give a very short reflection on the work that I've done on climate change litigation. Uh, until recently. Um, then Christoph is going to tell us a little bit more about um, public international law initiatives and, the, and then Miles will um, give us some information on some of the latest science on detection attribution. And the, the story starts for me back over 10 years ago when there was a huge amount, amount of concern at what was then a failure of politicians to respond to the climate change issue. Um, which now, all these years on, is even more strongly um, appalling. And the third assessment report in 2001 gave a very strong statement in respect of the, the level of confidence that scientists had in um, the human influence on temperature increase in the last half of the 20th century. And that inspired myself and Rhoda Bahayan to set up the Climate Justice Programme um, under the auspices of Friends of the Earth International and to work with lawyers and campaigners and scientists around the world to start thinking what the domestic law had to say about climate change and the extent to which climate change was, if you like, of now relevance to, now relevant to um, individual countries, not only, and lawyers in, in domestic jurisdictions, not only at the public international law level. And over that period, there have been, since the last 10 years or so, an array of legal cases using different legal theories, different causes of action, different legal tracks that um, with varying amounts of success have been brought uh, in courts around the world and particularly of course in the United States. The interesting thing now is of course that the, uh, there is a lot more, uh, at least noise anyway, about public international law um, affording um, some legal remedies for states who are suffering the impacts of climate change and that will be something that we'll come on to discuss. But in terms of domestic litigation we've seen a lot of cases using what I would call simple public law theories taking legal action um, around, uh, around public duties of public bodies to act in, 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 in relation to climate change um, under environmental impact legislation uh, and uh, freedom of environmental information legislation. Um, some excellent cases by people like Brendan Cummings in the US on the endangered species legislation. Um, we've seen some also some sort of soft law kind of cases, international cases like um, petitions to UNESCO. Um, the, we've had human rights petition by the um, uh, Sheila Watt Cloutier and, um, and the Inter-American Commission. And we've seen some uh, constitutional rights cases, of course, in Nigeria to try and stop gas flaring. Uh, but the really interesting cases, I think, now, because I think, it, I think it's quite clear now that we've got a, 
a, a, a reasonable judicial acceptance of the science, as I would see it, that the really interesting legal cases now um, are around in the, in the sphere of human rights and tort cases, civil wrongs, where cases where people can sue for damages or sue for injunctions. And the only case, the only tort cases that have been brought so far, of course, are in the United States. And there is, a, a, if you like, a, um, a degree of uh, uncertainty still hanging over the Kivalina case while we wait to hear um, where the appeal goes there. And um, it's a, um, as, as those of us who watch this know, using a very traditional tort of public nuisance to bring that kind of case. Uh, Kivalina, as people know, is a village that is threatened by and is having to move as a result of, um, uh, of erosion and the effects of the sea um, uh, breaking away the, uh, the village. The, one of the questions, interestingly, that we've had um, has been how would a, and I think it's from, uh, from German Watch, um, has been to what extent would the, um, thanks Miles, um, how would the Kivalina case be decided in the UK? What are the differences in the understanding of causation or causality between common law and civil law systems? And the, um, I think, of course, if I could rephrase the question in the sense of if there was a village such as, like Kivalina that was threatened in a similar way as a result of the, the, the impacts of climate change, could such a case be brought in one of the jurisdictions of the United Kingdom? And my view would be that, yes, absolutely, such a case could be brought. And the question then would be, who would it be brought against? And in my view, there's always been three categories of potential defendants in tort cases. Uh, those who produce fossil fuel, those who emit fossil fuel, and those whose activities facilitate uh, the, the emission of fossil fuel. Uh, the more interesting question perhaps is whether such a case would succeed and there I think the case is, the, 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 the argumentation is something that's being developed in the Kivalina case already. It's continuing to be developed by lawyers and people who think about these things and it seems to me that it's only a matter of time before these kinds of cases are brought in jurisdictions other than the United States. In terms of the distinction between common law and civil law causation and balance of probabilities, um, uh, sorry, uh, causation tests, the balance of probabilities or the preponderance of the evidence um, tends to be the verbal formulation in, of the uh, standard of proof in civil cases in, in, in common law countries. Crudely, that's put at uh, numerically at 51% certainty. Uh, and in fact, as I said earlier on, the, the very reason that uh, I was motivated to look into climate change and the law um, t t 12 years ago was because the uh, third assessment report had said that it was at least 66% confident that most of the warming in the second part of the 20th century had been caused by human activities. And so we can see that there's a scientific, in, in that crude comparative way, uh, a scientific um, uh, finding of confidence that's higher than the civil 51% um, uh, level of confidence. Um, my understanding from civil law for jurisdictions, so countries like Germany or France or not, n not common law countries like the UK or like England and Wales and, and, and um, uh, Canada, US, Australia, uh, is that, that judges have, uh, have a much stricter standard of proof in terms of causation, that the judges are tied down a lot more by their law than judges are in common law countries. But I'm not a, I'm not a civil lawyer, of course, and there might be some civil lawyers who would, who would like to say something about that. Um, and Christoph, perhaps you're even a civil lawyer, although I know you're, of course, a, an international lawyer um, uh, predominantly, but you, you will also be more familiar with, uh, with the civil law system than I am. But it's quite clear, it seems to me, that there, there is possibility of these, of these cases coming forward if there are people who have suffered from the impacts of climate change in the same way that, that people in Kivalina have done. 
I think the I think that's all I'm going to say in terms of introduction and and and, and a feel and a, a broad overview. Um, I think we I'd be very interested to see um, any questions that come through um, if we can address them. And um, I'll hand over now to Christoph for him to tell us a little bit about the uh, how because of the, the 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 appalling failure in the climate negotiations over many years now to grapple with this, that countries are getting um, uh, more confident uh, and more and more noisy and loud about saying, look, there are some international law rules here that apply and we are going to seek enforcement of these rules if politicians do not agree adequate emission reductions to deal with climate change. So, um, Christoph. Thank you, Peter. Um, international law essentially characterizes the relationship between states, or I should say international environmental law, does um, through the principle or the notion that activities under control or jurisdiction of one state shouldn't harm another state. And this is, or the, the, the precedent usually cited in this connection concerns um, a smelter on the Canadian side of the border that, or whose fumes affected the US side of the border. And the um, arbitral tribunal in that case found in 1941 that no state has the right to use or permit the use of its territory in such a manner as to cause injury by fumes in order to the in or to the territory of another or the properties of persons therein. And this basic notion or principle has then um, subsequently been introduced and integrated in various um, international law and policy documents. Just to mention one, the um, UN Framework Convention on the Law of the Sea or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and a more contemporary elaboration of this principle can be found, for instance, in Principle 1 of the Stockholm, Stockholm Declaration, which states that states have the sovereign right to exploit their own resources and at the same time the responsibility to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states or to areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. And the application of this principle was then confirmed by the International Court of Justice in 1996, which in the um, advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons and the ICJ in that decision stated that the existence of the general obligation of states to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction and control respect the environment of other states or areas beyond national control is now part of the corpus of international law relating to the environment. So the recognition of this principle is beyond doubt. Some people refer to it as the no harm rule or the prohibition of transboundary pollution or the principle of prevention and of course the terminology used is often indicative of what people think but I think the important the, the important thing here is that the principle is generally accepted and what is also accepted is that in order to trigger off the application of the principle a certain threshold of harm, serious harm, significant harm or substantial harm has to be met. Everything else, what are the legal consequences of this situation, for instance, um, is more or less contentious. There is probably no... There's probably, I'm sorry about this. Um, there's probably no um, strict or absolute prohibition on transboundary pollution, but rather an obligation of states to regulate and control with due diligence. But what then constitutes this proper care or due diligence is of course a contentious legal issue. And it is, there's probably also a balance that one needs to strike in each case between the right to exploit resources and the right to development on one hand and the and, and, and the no-harm principle 
on the other side. So the situation is fundamentally, fundamentally different um, for countries like China and India and um, the UK or the US on the other side. <coughs> and finally, and I'm painting with a very broad brush here of course, um, finally to what extent this principle and this idea can be applied to climate change which is a very complex scientific phenomenon and primarily results in atmospheric pollution is also not clear. But in order to clarify some of these legal issues, um, domestic litigation can be a useful tool. But in order to achieve some kind of clarification at the global or international level, there are basically two avenues. One would be uh, some form of dispute resolution under public international law between states. Here you might well have a substantive right but not necessarily a procedural avenue to enforce or get those rights acknowledged. And then the other avenue is an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice. These advisory opinions are not binding, but they carry a significant moral and also legal weight. In order to submit such, an, such a request for an advisory opinion, um, a majority in the UN General Assembly is required. There are also other UN agency that might, might request an advisory opinion, but um, the UN General Assembly, uh, an organ of the um, UN, is probably the most relevant one. And this is exactly what has happened last year. Palau, supported by various other countries, has launched such an in initiative in the General Assembly. And the question that they first asked in the UN General Assembly was whether states have have a legal responsibility to ensure that any activities on their territory that emit greenhouse gases do not harm other states. And at this point, I probably should have moved on to my slides. I'm I was wondering what you were going to do with your slides. Well, I, somebody could have pointed it out to me. I'm very <coughs> sorry about this, but I knew there would be some hiccups during um, this presentation because we haven't done this before. <laughs> no. So, th so, so this is this is what Palau first asked in the UN General Assembly. But this is by no means a final question. That is the starting point of a process that they've initiated, and that'll continue. And on that backdrop, we organized a meeting of lawyers in London last year to just think about the right question or maybe a series of questions that might be useful. And um, as a starting point, we looked at existing precedent and previous questions and, for instance, at the most, probably the most prominent one in connection with the nuclear weapons advisory opinion, is the threat or use of nuclear weapons in any circumstances permitted under international law? And this question at the time created a significant discussion inside and outside the courtroom and finally led to a renewal of the nuclear weapons non proliferation proliferation treaty and um, on that basis one could think about a similar scenario for the climate change negotiations and ask something very basic and straightforward like do Annex 1 countries or do industrialized countries have an obligation under international law to compensate developing countries for damages from climate change. This would potentially give the ICJ an opportunity to further define existing principles of international law and move the debate forward. Other principles, uh, other questions that one could think about in this connection are, for instance, 
to zoom in on a specific case and say and ask something like can states can state so and so be held responsible under public international law for damage caused by sea level rise and extreme weather events to state as a so and so as a result of global warming or one could try to tease out useful legal findings and ask something along the lines of do states have a duty under international law to undertake a transboundary risk assessment and environmental impact assessment before approving activities which could result in significant transboundary harm. A question that is discussed in uh, the academic world and that the ICJ could then help to clarify. Finally, um, it would also be possible to think about a question that specifically supports the cause of vulnerable countries and strategic, strategically identifies um, entry points in existing legislation. And one could think about something like, are member states of the European community under a legal obligation to apply the precautionary principle in determining their emission reduction and limitation targets? And I could go on and on and on like this forever, but I won't. Um, I also need to say that this is, of course, a very convenient, interesting academic discourse that doesn't really address the main problem that Palau and others currently have in the UN General Assembly, which is to find a majority of vote that supports their initiative. And I think that because such a question would give the ICJ an opportunity to elaborate and strengthen existing principles and idea and clarify, um, any question is essentially a good question and would help to create a discussion outside the courtroom and maybe encourage large conservation NGOs to lobby their governments to support this, um, this initiative and instigate a whole discourse outside the climate change meetings that would then put pressure on the conferences and um, I think this is partially also what we are already trying to do with these events. So I hope some of this was useful. Thank you. Christoph, thank you very much for that. Can I, when you, you know, going back to your list of questions there, um, I noticed that you didn't put up any questions about um, the law of the sea. And a question has come in from uh, Keely Boom. I was asking if it's possible to put an UNCLOS related legal question to the ICJ. What do you think about that? Well, I think what gets lawyers really excited um, about this situation is that there's potentially a conflicting jurisdiction between the ICJ and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. But I think in practice that wouldn't be a problem and of course this, the ICG, ICJ as the World Court could look at all aspects of a case, including of course the application of the Law of the Sea. Convention and there is there is an article article 194.2 that um, uh, re essentially repeats the Stockholm principle and um, puts an obligation on countries to refrain and prevent pollution of the marine environment mm. of other countries. So mm. I think you know a, 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 an unclosed question could be could be very useful. I always. I've always seen UNCLOS as particularly useful in connection with um, the possibility of finding a forum that parties haven't agreed upon because there is, a, there is the possibility to use the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea um, in connection with a provisional measures case. And um, in that case it has a compulsory jurisdiction. So it wouldn't need the approval of both parties as long as they are members of UNCLOS, of course. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be of particular importance in this kind of context where you need to have a forum to hear the issue. Uh, if it is a case that there is compulsory um, dispute um, resolution mechanism, then that would seem to me to be um, an area that is worthy of a lot yeah. of consideration. It, it, it's only compulsory uh, with regard to provisional measures. But I think that 
countries like Palau or Kiribati or Tuvalu, low-lying Pacific Islands, for instance, who is pure existence or is already threatened might well think about this mm -hmm. opportunity in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got a question for both of you actually. <coughs> Peter, you listed um, four possible defendants in a climate change case, um, but you didn't list, and you sort of alluded to this, you didn't list the emissions authorizer. And I know that I know that UNFCCC is meant to be the good guys in this, but mm -hmm. one of the possible applications, that, you know, Overwhelmingly, it looks likely that any negotiated deal, um, at the moment that doesn't look to be one at all, but any negotiated deal is likely to authorize, uh, potentially will authorize much higher emissions than we can actually afford or, or than would be tolerable for many developing countries. So then the question is, you know, if a, if a company has legitimate emission permits from the European Commission or, you know, if, if, if a company's then it's hard for that to argue that company is liable, that the fault really lies with the conference or the process that determines these very high um, emission levels. Could, that, could they be brought in? Could, could people end up suing the UNFCCC? Uh, if you're asking me, no, I would say. Um, in terms of domestic law, um, the... If you're bringing a legal action against, and this, you know, this is talking about my own jurisdiction, that if, if you're bringing an action against a public body, such as, you know, as you say, the emissions um, authoriser, then th those actions are usually brought as what we call judicial reviews. They're, they're, they're a different kind of legal action to torts, to, to, the, to wrongs against the... And of course, it's very relevant to the extent to which uh, to which a particular activity is legally relevant, the extent to which a, a particular legal activity has been authorised by statute, as it were, in, in, in a way that was, the, that was the reason the Supreme Court in the AEP case decided that, uh, it, the, 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 that the tort case couldn't yep. be brought because of preemption, um, as, it, as it's called there. Um, and so, though, in, 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 it, it's clear that there needs to be um, um, very clear statutory um, authority to carry out the particular um, polluting activity, as it were, for, for common law rights to be preempted. And it's arguable whether, for example, the emissions trading system is such a, preempt, a, is such a preemptive form of regulation. Internationally, um, I don't know, Christoph, if you want to if you want to respond internationally. I don't have a clear-cut answer to that, but the, um, the uh, UNFCCC is, has, has a distinct legal personnel, distinct from its members. So if it persistently fails to accomplish certain objectives, I, you know, I could see how, how you might be able to construct a legal case around that, but I'm not sure who would be the claimant and I'm not sure what the legal forum would be where you would um, try to pursue such a case. But you could almost argue that um, a weak deal in the UNFCCC might almost be the worst possible outcome for a developing country that's adversely affected by climate change because it authorizes all these emissions, preempts any compensation claims and doesn't actually solve the problem. So you could argue in that under those circumstances, the UNF triple C. You know, the, the I don't think preemption will work in the same way in international law as it would work in individual domestic jurisdictions. I think if you have a weak deal at the UNFC, this is my own view, and I'd be interested because I mean, it is it's a fundamental principle of international law and has been for you know it's not controversial that states must not harm other states, and if in fact if 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 states are going to agree a weak deal it's going to require those states who are concerned about the impact of that weak deal to make it absolutely clear that they are not waiving and giving away their rights and the customary international law to hold those states to account in, in, as a result of greenhouse gas emissions so the right under the no harm rule which which Christopher has explained continues Unless it's, it's very clear that they're giving away those rights, so I, I the, the preemptive the preemption has got no is a very different argument in international law to what it is in domestic law.
How can the science help us? Well, okay. So well, yeah, there, yeah that, that, there we are. You are. Yeah, you take over my job of <laughs> presenter. I want to ask you another question before um, before you uh, before we go on to Miles and other science. As it's coming from um, from a, a person called Guy, who's described as a lawyer in the DRC in Congo in Central Africa, and he asks, is there any international environmental law instrument that protects the atmosphere and that will serve as a basis for polluter liability? There are, s there are several international conventions that um, ban, for instance, certain chemicals and in order to protect the atmosphere. And of course, the um, ultimate objective of the UNFCCC, UNFCCC is to protect the global atmosphere. But there is not yet an agreement that protects the atmosphere in a more holistic manner and also decides whether we treat the atmosphere, for instance, as a natural resource or as a common concern or how we allocate it. The argument that a lot of developing countries are making at the moment is that it's allocated on a per capita basis. Um, there is no basis for this in international law. It might be a very strong moral ar argument, though. Um, so, no, but I know that um, the uh, International Law Commission's committee one of the committees currently looks into the possibility of drafting a convention that protects specifically the atmosphere. But I think they are in the very early stages of developing ideas around that. Right, well, that's very interesting. Okay, Miles, over to you. Thank and you. Please tell us how you can help. Well, all of this, I guess, is predicated on the notion that climate change is causing harm. And it may seem rather odd for a scientist at this stage of the game to be actually raising that as a question. Um, but that's the kind of research we do. That's what we, and, and you may be surprised to know that establishing actual or imminent harm from climate change um, is a remarkably challenging task. If I could um, put up some slides here, um, the, um, the, the, the main source of the problem when you're trying to assign uh, harm to climate change is that harm almost invariably arises from extreme weather. Um, the sort of slow changes in temperature that we can relatively confidently attribute to human influence on climate. Peter mentioned in his introduction that back in the year 2000, we were getting reasonably confident that the warming we were seeing at a global scale was due to human influence on climate. But that global warming doesn't in itself do anybody any harm. What causes harm? are the extreme weather events that may have been made more, and in some cases less likely, as a result of that large-scale climate change. For example, um, if we go back to, to some slides, um, you know, in 2010, uh, we had an unprecedented, uh, in the historical record at least, unprecedented heat wave in Russia, which um, is estimated to have caused some 50,000 deaths from respiratory illnesses and so forth, and a very substantial cost to the Russian economy. Um, the, the, the temperature image here in this slide shows that very localized region in central Russia where temperatures were 12 degrees above normal for that time of year. So it was an extraordinary event uh, accompanied by wildfires, um, uh, uh, serious smogs in Moscow and so forth uh, with a very substantial cost in both in human and economic terms. Now, the question which has raised, raged ever since, really, is was human influence on climate anything to do with it? So if we look at it, some of the things that have been said in the literature, I sort of emphasize this is a difficult task, and we have papers appearing, um, you know, on the one hand saying the intention of Russian heat wave was mainly due to natural internal variability, and then another paper also appearing last year saying an approximate 80% probability that heat record would not have occurred without climate warming. So those appear to be you know, highly contradictory statements. Even, even further out, we had Al Gore in the Climate Reality Project saying, you know, we're not only loading the dice, we're painting more dots on the dice. We're not just rolling 12s, we're soon rolling 13s, 14s, and 15s. Um, so understanding how we link human influence on climate to extreme weather events is central to the attribution of actual harm. If we look at this in a little bit more detail, we've been doing a lot of this work in Oxford. Um, some of you may have come across the climateprediction.net uh, weather at home project where we're simulating the climate as it is and the climate both as it was in the past uh, 
and as it might have been in the absence of human influence on climate, um, to see how the risk or the frequency of extreme weather events has changed. And what we do in order to do this, it, it is very much a rolling dice analogy um, where you have to roll the dice many, many times in order to assess the extent to which the loading has changed to see if you're getting too many sixes, if you like. And the more extreme the event you're looking at, the more, um, the, the more often you have to roll the dice to, to, to work out whether, um, whether it's being affected. Um, our laboratory in this is, uh, is you. It's uh, people around the world who run these climate models for us, and they send their results back to our servers uh, in Oxford. And uh, if anybody's watching who's actually participating in this, in this experiment, we're extremely grateful for your computing time. And these are some of the results we're getting out of this. If we go uh, to look at specifically what we've done on the Russian heat wave in a paper that's actually published uh, today um, in Geophysical Research Letters, in fact, uh, I think by, I can talk to you about this because the press release was, went out five minutes ago. Um, so so it's, it's auspicious timing. Um, and what we find, um, interestingly, I quoted those results from uh, the, the, those two papers in 2011, which looked contradictory. What we find is they're both right. And it illustrates the, re the, the challenge that lawyers face when dealing with this, that you really have no option but to get your minds around the whole problem of how human influence affects climate. Um, you can't just ask an expert to tell you the answer because the way you frame the question has a, first, you know, has a direct impact on the kind of, result you, uh, kind of answer you're going to get. Um, what this um, graph illustrates, this is the only technical graph in this presentation, um, it shows in the horizontal the return time of a heat wave. That's the risk of a heat wave happening in any given year. 10-year return time, there's a 1 in 10 risk of it happening. 100-year return time, 1 in 100 and so on. Obviously, higher events, higher temperature thresholds happen less often. That's why the curves both move up to the right. And uh, the blue curve is the 2000s, the most recent decade, and the green curve is the 1960s. And as you can see, there's been a shift. Um, the 2000s is to the left of the 1960s, meaning the same size of event has become more likely as a result of the large-scale warming, most of which is attributable to human influence on climate. On the other hand, compared to mean conditions, you know, that was a very substantial event. It was a very large temperature anomaly. The contribution the, the amount by which the curve has been shifted upwards is quite small. So in a sense, the same event was both mostly natural in terms of its magnitude, but also mostly anthropogenic in terms of its probability of occurrence. And although, if, although that sounds like a counterintuitive pair of statements, you just have to get your minds around it because that is the way it works. Could you say um, that again, actually? So, just slowly. Just uh, sure. The, the, the point is, r remembering, to, to take, I talked about loaded dice, but imagine a roulette wheel, okay, with two zeros on it. Do you, do you, 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 you can work with roulette. So, so you know, um, the zero on the roulette wheel is when the bank wins, okay? Um, now, if you have a roulette wheel with two zeros, normally there's only one zero. So there's a one in 32 chance, one in 33 chance of it landing on zero. You have two zeros. Obviously, you're going to double the chance of it landing on zero. But there's still a huge element of chance in whether it lands on the zero. So you could say it's mostly down to chance whether you get a zero. But if the odds on the zero have been doubled, you probably wouldn't want to play in that casino. Okay, so that's, that's the, 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 the two ways of looking at the problem that we have to understand. So we're seeing events that are still relatively unlikely. These are the events that cause damage. Um, and therefore, when they happen, if we sort of anatomize what has caused them, most of it is natural. So most of what went into the Russian heat wave was natural. And yet the odds of an event of that magnitude occurring in 2010 were, in, were, in, were increased, were inflated by the large-scale human-induced warming. That's, that's what we get out of this study. The one thing we do find, so, so we can say both um, Randy Dole and his co-workers and Stefan Ramsdorf and his co-worker um, were, were right in what they said about the heat wave. The one um, point we can argue with, we can say is, is probably not a helpful way of thinking about this, is this idea that we're seeing weather events that simply would not have happened in the absence of human influence on climate. That is very hard to support. Mm. 
um, and a very dangerous line to take because um, it, you know, if you go beyond the science in this, uh, it's, it's fatal. I mean, you, you also don't need to, as you pointed out. Um, in, in tort cases, balance of probability is enough. You don't need to prove that but for human influence on climate, this event would not have occurred. Uh, you simply have to show that the probability of it occurring has been increased by a substantial yeah. amount. But what do you, what do you say to, to critics who are um, particularly concerned about the reliability of modelling, for example? The, you know, the uh, rubbish in, rubbish out, boys with toys, whatever they well, want to, you know, that. But what's, what's your, what do you think are, what, what, what in your view are the most relevant criticisms that are made of climate modelling, but which, notwithstanding those criticisms, do not persuade you that the results of these models are not to be relied upon? Well, the, the crucial point here, I mean, there's no such... Um, the idea of a, a, a climate model, and talking about all climate models, it's a bit like talking about all mammals. I mean, there's a lot of different types of mammals in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's many different types of climate models which range um, from, you know, the very simple to the very complex and the very coarse to the very fine in terms of their, their resolution and the processes which they can represent. And typically the most reliable models we have are the ones which we test most often. Uh, they're the weather forecasting models. The, the models we use to forecast the weather every day, they are tested in the you know, in the, in the harsh light of, of, of forecasting, um, and they're tested to destruction. I mean, they, they, they really are um, pushed as, 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 as hard as they can and be. We know and we are extremely... they're not accurate. We, we understand why they're not accurate, because weather is chaotic, and we understand the behavior of these models very well, and we also understand their, you know, their, their, the things they can and can't do very well. Crucially, the attribution problem is much closer to weather forecasting than it is to the 2100 climate prediction problem. So if you're trying to predict the climate of 2100, you've got to get so many things right between now and 2100 that, you know, even most scientists don't call those sorts of things predictions. They say they're projections, they're scenarios. You know, that we, we're very hesitant about calling something at that far ahead a prediction. Whereas for this kind of problem, where you're just analysing why was the weather the way it was last year, it's much closer to the problem of, of, of forecasting the weather. Indeed, any, if, if, a, if a phenomenon can be represented in a weather forecast model, you can absolutely, you know, uh, confidently ask the question, how would the weather have been different without human influence? You can, you can do the forecast again, if you like, without human influence and see how the climate um, uh, how the climate would have been different. So it's, it's a very different sort of problem and many of the worst uncertainties in climate models don't really arise in this situation. Oh, that's interesting. So um, I mean, I've actually got some, an example coming up actually of how this works. So um, uh, just to, to, come, to come back to the, to the slides about what we can say, um, I sort of summed up what, what we would conclude about this, that a, a, a sort of 1% per year risk has been increased to a 3% per year risk which means you still be unlucky for it to happen, um, but less unlucky than you would have been. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, this is the kind of information that we can provide um, to, to, to decision makers and to lawyers. It's also important to stress, and this is an illustration here, similar kind of diagrams, um, that not all events are being made more likely. Mm -hmm. So we published a study last year um, in uh, uh, Nature of, of uh, the, the uh, journal Nature last year, um, uh, looking at the risk of um, floods in the UK in the year 2000. We took a long time to do the study. I mean, we did it very carefully. And we concluded that there had been roughly a 100% increase in risk, so roughly a doubling of risk um, of the floods that occurred in 2000 resulting from human influence on climate. Um, now, in a follow-up study, um, Alison Kay and co-workers in, in, in Wallingford, just near here, um, looked at the same runs and asked... What was the, how did the risk of a flood that didn't happen in the spring of 2001, how did that risk changed? Now, this may seem rather perverse, but, you know, back in 1947, we had a very severe floods in the UK, and they occurred in the spring as a result of snowmelt. And, of course, that kind of flood has actually become, as you can see from the right-hand diagram, where the blue line's been shifted off to the right compared to the green lines, that kind of flood has become less likely. So 
this is why I say it's very dangerous for the people like Al Gore to stand up and say all weather events have been made more likely by human influence on climate or, or, or all weather events are being you know, affected by human influence on climate, implying that somehow they're being made more likely. There's a serious scientific investigation that needs to be done to work out which are the ones being made more likely and which are the ones being made less likely. When people say weather is becoming more extreme, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it sort of implies that any extreme weather event is somehow because of climate change. That's not true. We have to, you know, we have to do the work, we have to, we have to do quite some quite difficult science in order to establish which are the ones which human influence on climate has actually made more likely and which less. Um. Miles, what would be your, your sort of overall assessment of, the, of how the detection and attribution science has developed, strengthened over the last decade or so? When I started off, it was, there was a very clear message from the scientific community that the detection and attribution uh, science was strongest on temperature increase when we were looking at all the different elements of the climate system, as it were. Um, and I'm wondering whether... Um, you, you, you know, th there's been developments in the in the human influence science that, if you like, uh, what's your sort of view well, over the over the over the last ten the years? Big, the Do, big, the big. For you yeah, to be coming I up mean, with these kinds yeah. of you know statements like 100% increase in risk of this particular flood, that's a very very strong scientific finding, it seems to me. Um, yeah, I mean the, the big ch the big development over the past ten years really has been an under uh, a developing understanding of the implications of climate change for the hydrological cycle. So we're starting to see um, evidence for human influence um, on climate affecting uh, precipitation patterns around the world and um, model, model evidence that involves modelling but it doesn't depend entirely on modelling um, of how it um, plays a role in individual weather events. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously it's precipitation for, for many, I mean, temperature affects a lot of people. Um, Kivalina is being affected by temperature, um, mm -hmm. that's, uh, but, some, uh, but precipitation probably affects more. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. understanding that link to precipitation mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's critical here. I've got another example mm -hmm. on precipitation mm -hmm. actually to, to I think it would be share. good to, um, um, we, I don't know how we're doing on, we've got l l quite a number of questions. Which we'd like to put as well. So I, I just wanted to another, flick through quickly, actually, like um, yeah. because um, we we've had about ten minutes. We had particularly it. because we had a question yeah. from Congo, and I, I know we've got a, uh, uh, a a lawyer from Congo who's interested, in, and mm. we've been doing some work, um, prompted in fact by, um, if I could just uh, flick straight to what a complaint that uh, Mike Hume raised in, uh, talking about this work. Mike was worried. If you could say who Mike Hume um, so is. So Mike Hume, it's uh, Professor Mike Hume at the University of East Anglia, has raised the sort of the reasonable concern that this kind of science could um, bias negotiations because it's easier for, his argument is, it's easier for those parts of the world, like Oxfordshire, which are well endowed with climate modelling facilities, to prove they're being affected by human influence on climate than for somewhere in Africa. And so his concern is that this could, this could introduce a sort of um, a, a, a bias in our, in our concern towards the sort of well-modeled parts of the world. So I just wanted mm. to, to wrap up with an example, some very mm. new results we've, we've had, looking at um, the uh, Congo Basin, uh, mm. so just illustrating the region there mm. on this map. And we've been studying uh, precipitation uh, and the risk of drought in this region. Mm -hmm. One of the remarkable results we found uh, is just how well our model, you were asking, you know, how good are the models? This is a model simulation in black and observations in blue yeah. of precipitation over the Congo Basin. That's a pretty good fit. Um, that, I mean, it's a, it's a remarkably high level of predictability right. um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, precipitation in that region. And if we look at what's happening over time, we can see the risk of droughts. Okay, so this is another one of these return time diagrams. You can see the 2000s, that dark blue line there, mm. has been On shifted away, yeah. sh shifted to the left compared to the other decades. So um, if, uh, uh, you know, if it proves, you know, if this is borne out by more research and so forth, mm. there is evidence mm. for um, large scale warming mm. that's occurred since the 1960s. Mm already having an impact on drought risk in Central Africa. Mm, so yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, there's, there's no question that mm. this is globally applicable, what we're doing here. Mm. I, I, I wouldn't want people to think just because I was talking about Russia and the UK that mm. the only parts of the world that this kind of science is, apl is mm. applicable to mm. is, is uh, yeah. uh, uh, are yeah. countries with, with yeah. a, a long tradition in climate modeling. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this, is, this is generally <coughs> applicable work. And how would you deal with the problem of lack of data 
in the context of your model. I know it was an issue, for example, on sea level rise and tide gauge data. How long does it exist for? I think that you, you, you know, in, 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 to, in to different parts of the world, there'll be less data. Yes. How do you approach that? Um, I, data is crucial here, crucial for, I mean, as I, as I, I showed you that, that diagram, it's crucial for um, having any confidence in the models is to show that they can reproduce what's going on in the real world. Mm. Um, so, however, I could, I could turn that around and say, um, this could be a very a great motivator to, mm. to countries to actually start maintaining better climate records mm. because I mean it's mm. it's one of the one of the difficulties we face is, yeah. is the challenge of, of, of people keeping up these mm. uh, these climate records. Mm. Um, it's also you know it's not essential um, to have direct observations of something um, to make a statement about that it's being affected by. A process like climate change, mm. if you understand what's affecting it well enough, mm. I mean, you can, you know, we can use um, our understanding of the system. We don't mm. just have to rely on on observations. In fact, we mm. we 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 have to use our understanding of the system um, because, you know, as back to the rolling dice analogy, if you had to wait um, to see the climate changing, you know, it would have changed mm. before you had enough data to be mm. able to document mm. the change. Mm. So, you know, we, we have to, uh, mm. we have to use models to do yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Marcel, for that. Um, we've got one specific question here, which seems to be a scientific question. Um, and we've had a few more questions as well. Anna, Anna Carline has, from Field has been helping us with questions coming in. Um, so over the, we've got about another 10 minutes or so. So, Perhaps um, this is a question from a professor in the University of Tokyo. And he says, I have heard that tropospheric ozone and black carbon are responsible for some 40% of climate change, whereas the so-called greenhouse gases are responsible for around 60%. Is this roughly true? If so, then it may be easier to conceive climate change in the transboundary context. What do you think? Um, it, it's a very difficult one because the, the way you measure um, the relative importance of different agents is heavily complicated by the fact that they have very, very different lifetimes. If you put CO2 into the atmosphere, it continues to influence the climate for centuries. So all of the carbon dioxide that we've released um, since 1750 or so, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, is continuing to affect the climate today. Mm. Whereas um, tropospheric ozone uh, and, and black carbon mm. uh, affect the climate for a few weeks, you know, months, and that's it, and then they're, they're washed mm. out of the system. Right. So um, the, to quantify the harm done yes. by today's emissions mm. of tropospheric ozone and black carbon is, is a very difficult thing because yes. you know, uh, what time frame are you interested in? Are you yes. talking about their, you know, today's emissions of carbon dioxide have only a limited impact on next year's climate, mm. um, but they will continue to have an impact mm. on years, mm. you know, mm. two to 200. Yeah. Um, and so that's the issue we face. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is a, it's a very difficult one to, to uh, it, 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 it's, it's not clear it's answer. Very, very then, really. answer. Just, no. But but the, the no. one thing, the, the key thing is um, that carbon dioxide is the one which accumulates, and therefore the one which does the most damage in the long term. Yes, right. Okay. Well, let's. Um, um, uh, some questions have been coming in from the viewers, um, and I'm going to read this one out and see whether um, Miles or Christoph or myself, indeed, want to respond to it from from the Pacific Calling Partnership. It says. What hope can you give to people living in Pacific Island countries like Tuvalu and Kiribati that the legal issues you are raising will help to deliver timely mitigation so that they can remain living in their island homes? Greatly increased and timely adaptation funding and culturally acceptable migration options? Question mark. I think, uh, Christoph. I would ask. I think hope is all we can give them at the moment, unfortunately. Is it our job to give hope? <laughs> Sorry. I, well, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise we can all go home, couldn't we? So I think, I think um, of course, I hope that um, consolidated advocacy efforts will have an impact on the climate negotiations and the decisions that policymakers take in the future but whether it'll come in time to prevent low-lying pacific islands like tuvalu from 
partially disappearing, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't want to come across as a cynic, but I'm beginning to doubt it. And that's um, why, and, and, and quite frankly, when you go to these climate change negotiations, um, it's quite upsetting at times to see how all the different policymakers and negotiators have basically decided to manage the problem. And there's no outburst of anger, or very rarely is, but you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, for me, that is where the hope lies. The hope lies in the people who are most affected saying, enough is enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. And you and the rich countries are the ones who are to have to take responsibility for the situation that we're in. And, and so, if, and in that sense, it seems to me international law does, if, if the countries, and you can under, well understand why one country alone would not stand up to the rich world, but if the countries who are going to suffer the most collaborate and stand together, they have a message which is morally unanswerable, in my view, and equally that international law can help them through, these, through, through, through the no harm rule to, 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 to protect their interests. I, I, I can't remember who said it now that, that the sort of great motivators um, in, in our system are fear and greed. Um, it's very difficult to see how greed um, could, um, and you could argue that greed has got us into this mess. Um, so how can fear get us out of it? Well, at the moment, releasing carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is a, is a risk-free activity. Mm. There's no risk involved in that. Even if we were to introduce carbon taxes and so forth, you pay your carbon tax, but you're still not taking a risk. You know the outcome. What these cases could bring, that what establishing the principle of liability could establish, is that any company that decides on a high carbon development path would be taking a risk on their future because they would be taking a, a, they would be taking a risk that they get clobbered um, for compensation claims by, by the, the likes of the Pacific Island states. And I think that's what, you know, we need to change this idea that, that mitigating climate change is somehow the risky activity and carrying on with business as usual is risk-free. Um, you know, we need, we need to reverse that. Because unfortunately, for, for, you know, for the companies that are primarily engaged in this, and indeed for the countries that are primarily engaged in this, that is the current situation. Yes, yes. Christoph, there's a question here from you, from a PhD candidate. Um, Margarita Verinka. Um, she says, what in your opinion could be the impact of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities on the apportionment of responsibility for climate change under international law? Well, I think the answer to that is that a lot of the developing countries argue that this principle has a lot to do with previous greenhouse gas emissions and that, for instance, if the International Court for justice found that um, this is right and that there is a historic responsibility and that the polluter should be paying for damages, then um, this principle could be used to um, uh, support the cause of vulnerable countries and societies. And if I can just say, I'm, I think we're a bit overwhelmed with the number of questions coming in, so we won't be able to address them all. But um, what we do, we send you brief responses when we're back home in the office. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I think we kind of come to uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, thank you both, Christoph and Miles and Anna and the crew here for uh, uh, bringing us here, feeding us nicely at lunch, and uh, and and doing the necessary and. Um, Miles, you said, Miles, that, that fear and greed are motivators, and I think anger is also a motivator in this context. Love is as well. And I think that the, the anger that's felt by around the world about the approach to climate change has led to increased interest in litigation. Because at the end of the day, if in my, the way I see it, if there's any justification for law, it is that it means that when there is a dispute, we don't kill each other. Here is a system that we have for resolving the disputes and there isn't a bigger dispute or a dispute over a bigger issue than the question of climate change. So thank you all very much for listening in and for your questions and hopefully we're, together we will see an interesting development of the use of the law to do what we can through the law to help the climate change issue. Thank you. <laughs>